Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to CS109, lecture three. Um, so uh, we just checked registrations today. So far we have close to 400 students in this class, including the online students. So uh, this is gonna be the biggest edition of CS109 ever, as we had expected, so that's fantastic. Uh, today I'll be talking about exploratory data analysis and effective visualizations, which are important tools for you to get going on your endeavor to become a data scientist. But before a couple of announcements, um, homework zero is due today. It's not going to be graded, but we would like you to hand it in today. And please, by all means, get it done today. Because homework one is going to be out tonight. And so homework one requires basically the setup and the GitHub skills that hopefully you learned in homework zero for you to be successfully submitting your homework. Check the syllabus for the grading, late day, and collaboration policies that we mentioned in the first lectures. If you're not familiar with them, those are the policies that we're gonna use throughout the semester. And we know that uh, you know, the sectioning isn't quite ready yet for you to actually indicate your preferences. As far as I understand, right now it's only visible in one of the three course numbers. So we're working hard to get that fixed. So please keep an eye on Piazza where we'll announce uh, when that is going to be ready for you to indicate your preferences. As we said, for now, especially next week, just go to the section that works best for you and don't worry about preferences. You can also shop sections if you like, you know, go to one. If you don't like it, try another one uh, so that you figure out what is the section that you actually would like to end up taking. Okay. So before I get started with my lecture, important uh, data science news. Uh, the Pats, and in particular Tom Brady, made it onto the 538 block, which I think is important. I think I just saw that today. So uh, the headlines are 2015 NFL preview, Tom Brady, Tom Brady, Tom Brady, and then in brackets and the rest of the AFC East. Uh, the 538 block, in case you don't know it, was started by Nate Silver that we mentioned in the first lecture. And it's a fantastic data science block. They do really cool analysis of sometimes obscure and sometimes really relevant, important topics. And of course, football is important. So I think this is relevant, and in particular here in the Northeast. One of the graphs that caught my attention was this one here. This is Brady's value as you know, this uh, game suspension is being uh, either dismissed or is being enforced by the NFL. So if you look at this graph, here are the expected wins. So if Brady doesn't miss any of the games, he's expected to win close to 10 games, which will make it about 90% or 80% likely that the Pats will win, or sorry, will make it into the playoffs. And if he misses four games, as I believe the current suspension would indicate, then he's only gonna win close to nine games, which will drop the likelihood of the playoffs to closer to 68% or something. So anyway, fun reading for those of you who are interested in football. Uh, please check out the 538 blog. I think it's worthwhile subscribing, and uh, I always get a kick out of their analyses. So today we're gonna to talk about a different step in the data science pipeline. Last time, Verena talked about getting the data and putting it into a shape that you can work with. And today we'll talk about exploring the data in particular. So data exploration is difficult because we're not always sure what we're looking for, which is why it's very important to use visualization and questions that will guide your initial exploration to kind of make sense of what is it that this data can tell us. Now we're not suggesting that you just go blindly searching for the needle in the haystack. You always should be guided by initial hypotheses or initial questions. And that's why having a good question is always important. But those questions can change. Once you start looking at the data, you have more questions, you have different questions, and you might find things in the data that you didn't expect. So I'll start this with an example. This is an example data set of antibiotics and their effectiveness. And uh, this was put together by Will Burton in 1951 
And then he created a nice visualization that I'll, I'll show you a little bit later. So here is the data. It's a table. So on one hand, you have bacteria with their genus and their species. Then you have different antibiotics, penicillin, streptomycin, and neomycin. And unfortunately, I believe all of us are aware with at least some of those, because probably all of us had to take them at some point in our lives. On the right is gram staining, which is a particular stain that biologists use to look at those different bacteria. And so a bacteria is either gram negative, in which case it is this pink color on the upper right, or it's gram positive, in which case it's this purple color. And so that's another variable in this data set. And finally, you have the actual numerical data in here, which is the minimum inhibitory concentration for the antibiotics to be effective against that particular strain of bacteria. So this is you know, measured in milliliters per grams. So uh, just a quick question, what is better here in terms of effectiveness if the number are small or if the numbers are large? Small, right? So you want to have very small concentration to actually kill that bacteria. OK, so that's the data. What I'd like you to do is look at this data and come up with one or two questions that you might ask of this particular data set. And I'm going to give you about 90 seconds. I'd like you to talk to your neighbors and just think about what are the questions that we can ask that might be interesting now that we have this data set. So please discuss for 90 seconds. And then I'll ask around to get common opinions. Okay, so give me a couple of questions, anybody. Yes? Um, could you sort of divide antibiotics by genus and see if they're more effective in certain genes? Look at the effectiveness of different genus of antibiotic. What's the plural of genus? Geni? <laughs> Genuses? Uh, of different genuses of bacteria. Um, sorry, say again. You want to group them by genus and then? Try each antibiotic to see if you can specialize the antibiotics. Ah, can you specialize the antibiotics? OK. So maybe to put this more in a data science question, we are not biologists. We're not going to actually tweak the bacteria, right? Uh, sorry, the antibiotics. But maybe it's about how effective are different antibiotics currently against different genuses of bacteria. Is that fair? OK. All right, so effectiveness of the antibiotics against different genuses of bacteria, all right? Yes? The toxicity of the antibiotic, I mean, toxicity may be a wrong word, but basically how harmful it is to your body versus how little of it you need. That's, That's right. So, and the assumption is that, sorry, the answer was toxicity, toxicity of the antibiotics and how harmful it is uh, towards your body. Um, and the assumption would be that lower concentrations of the antibiotics will be safer, 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, given the uh, accept, uh, accept, uh, acceptable level of concentration, which IG biologists can feel as uh, many the, the bacteria? Uh, like, uh, right. So given a specific or given safe levels of the antibiotics, which ones of them can heal which bacteria? Or sorry, can kill which bacteria? Is that, is that the same question? I think so, right? Sort of effectiveness of the antibiotics towards different... Oh, for specific bacteria, okay. Ah, so which antibiotic is the most effective? Basically for as many bacteria as possible. Okay, all right, that's a good question. Yes, back there. Um, if some antibiotics work together to produce different results than they would individually. Yes, so can we take combinations of antibiotics to kill maybe even more bacteria, right? And would that be more effective than taking just one? Okay, good. Yes? You could ask if penicillin is more effective against negative versus positive staining. Yeah, how does it relate to gram staining? So the, the answer was, can you figure out which antibiotics are more effective depending on the gram staining? Yeah. So how that correlates with the gram staining? Yeah. Yes? So um, the answer was prediction, right? Basically, given that I know certain effectiveness, can I predict uh, with a new bacteria if those drugs will also be effective towards those? Good. So those are good answers. Now, Will Burton, when he collected this data, answered a particular question with a visualization. So here is the visualization that Will Burton came up with. This was re-implemented by Mike Bostock, but uh, this is just the modern version of what Will Burton did. Just take a look at this. Um, I want to point out red is gram negative and blue is gram, or sorry, blue purplish is gram positive. Um, just look at this and tell me this particular visualization, what question that we just discussed would it answer? Yeah, so it tells you something about the effectiveness of the different antibiotics against gram-negative and gram-positive, right? So I think it gets to the question you were suggesting, that we're looking at the bacteria sort of in a binary way almost, like we have the ones that are gram-positive, the ones that are gram-negative, and then we look at the effect of how is effectiveness encoded here? Yes? Longer bars, right? Look at the scale, right? So Burton actually figured out that smaller concentrations means more effective. So he inverted the scale of the bar chart such that longer bars means more effective. Okay, so now that we know longer bars are more effective, can you tell me something about what this chart would suggest? So by the way, here is the question that it's answering, but what does this chart suggest? What's the answer to the question? Penicillin is good for gram positive. Any other suggestions? Yes. Neomycin is really effective for gram negative. Okay. Can we think of a combination of antibiotics? Yes. Yes. So penicillin and neomycin together. Now, is there a difference between gram positive and gram negative if you take both of them? Say again. No, I meant like just in the effectiveness. <laughs> Are you a biologist? <laughs> Apologies to all the biologists. I'm not a biologist. 
Anybody? Yes. You might not want to combine them for gram okay. negative or positive. Oh, they won't, they'll be less effective than the gram negative, but I just don't know if their effects can overlap. Okay. So here is, you know, what I think was the conclusion by Burton when he did this. He said if the bacteria is gram positive, take penicillin and neomycin. They're probably most effective. And if it's gram negative, neomycin is most effective. Um, so that's what he came up with. Um, now, what's interesting, um, Jeff here, who teaches a... Yes, please. Wait, how do you see that from these? Because, um, like, yes, I can see that penicillin and neomycin are very much in the positive, but the very negative, like, it doesn't, like, neomycin is effective and penicillin not so much, but the bars are still shorter overall for gram negative. So why would it be that you only need... Well, uh, neomycin is in black for gram negative, right? And so longer bars mean better or more effective. So you look at the black bars, they seem to be generally high for all of the gram-negative ones. So it's fair to say that neomycin alone is effective against all of the gram-negatives. And if you look at penicillin, penicillin in blue, it's actually not going to help in the gram-negative side. Does that make sense? Well, if you look at some of them, some of them are only like the Oh, please don't make me speak that. <laughs> well, the ones on the upper left, <laughs> they're, uh, they're, you know, not, the neomycin is not really effective. Whereas if you look at the blue bar on the upper left, penicillin is only effective for the ones on, up there. Right, so why would you need neomycin? Because of that. Gram positive is on the left. Right, so... See the ones up here? Let me see if I can indicate this. Oh, because on the other ones, like on these ones, neomycin is much more effective than penicillin alone. Okay, so uh, Jeff here gives this example in one of his visualization courses every year, and people come up with cool visualizations, and he basically does the same thing we just went through. And interestingly, I think 90% of the class basically does exactly this, the same question, you can answer it with different visualizations. You can make bar graphs. You can make stacked bar graphs. You can do all kinds of things. But fundamentally, they focused on this question. There is actually a very different question that you can ask, which is answered by a slightly different visualization. So this visualization here um, shows you resistance to different antibiotics. So the top one is resistant to penicillin streptomycin and neomycin. The second one is penicillin, streptomycin, and so on. So you see the effectiveness of the different antibiotics for the different genuses of the bacteria, right? And that's the one question that somebody asked. And if you look at this data, in this visualization, something should catch your attention. And maybe it doesn't, maybe it does, I'm curious. Has anybody noticed something a little bit curious about this particular Visualization or something that sticks out in the data? Yes? I'm sorry? Why is the axis at 0 0.1? Um, that's a good question that I can't answer. I think that's just sort of an arbitrary cutoff that they picked to show maybe above that level um, it's not as effective. <coughs> I would just focus on the grouping of the bacteria because this shows you which drugs are or which combinations of drugs are effective against which groups of bacteria. And there's something a little bit strange about the groupings of those bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the salmonella, or like the green ones, are generally just similar, um, similar medicines. So there is a clustering with different bacteria genuses. Yeah. So the salmonella are, you know, typically well treated by P and S. 
and the streptococcus, for example, are typically well treated by S and N. Okay. Now, if you look at it a little bit closer, you should notice something a little bit weird. Look at those clusterings. Yeah. So, I mean, what is the streptococcus cacali? Uh, right. Group with the salmonella, and the people thought there's pneumonia with the streptococcus. Exactly. So notice the streptococcus faecalis and the diplococcus pneumonia. Those kind of stick out in those clusters. And you know, lo and behold, those were actually misclassified. So turns out that is not a streptococcus, and it turns out that is really a streptococcus. But it took science about 30 years to figure out the first and about 20 years to figure out the second. Okay, now, I'm not suggesting that had they had this visualization, they would have figured this out. What I am suggesting is that once you ask the right questions, you might get very surprising results about your data. It could actually be that your data is not what you think it is or that somebody made a misclassification. And so I think that's really the lesson here. And in Jeff Heer's class, basically nobody ever figures this out, which is interesting, right? So now that's maybe not surprising, it took science 30 years to figure this out. But still, I think sometimes we have to ask very different questions, and sometimes we have to look at the data for a long time to really notice different patterns that might not be what we expect them to be. Here's a different visualization of the same data using now a scatter plot. So now you have the penicillin minimum concentration on one axis and the neomycin minimum concentration on the other axis. And again, you see those clusters of the bacteria. And again, there's two question marks because those two guys don't really seem to fit. And indeed, they were misclassified by science for a long time. So um, by the way, there was a fantastic article about this in the American Scientist 2009. And, and if you click on this slide when it's online, uh, it's going to get you there. It's called That's Funny. So in science, you know, it's not always about the Eureka. It's actually more about the that's funny moment, right? So you're looking at your data, and you're saying to yourself, wow, that's weird. And that might actually lead to great insights. So the person who noticed these kind of patterns, and the person who really coined the term exploratory data analysis is John Tukey, one of the great statisticians of the last century. And he says that the greatest value of a picture or of a visualization is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. So he was a big proponent of visualizing your data as soon as possible before you do any statistical analysis to just look at the patterns of the data. Look at the patterns that are in the data to come up with new interesting questions that might actually lead you to new discoveries. And sometimes you're looking at the data and you simply see there is a bug. You know, I, I didn't collect the data I expected. And so you have to fix those bugs as well. So visualization is an important tool for exploratory data analysis. Um, you know, I define visualization very broadly as conveying information through graphical representations of data. That's a very broad definition. And it covers all kinds of graphs and charts. And in this course, we will be using the Python Seaborn library for visualization, which is a really nice new, newer, newish library that allows you to make nice looking graphs in your IPython notebooks. And in homework one, you'll be working with Seaborn to do some exploratory data analysis. Now visualization has two fundamental goals, and we talked about those in the first lecture. On one hand, you want to explain, and on the other hand, you want to explore. And obviously today, we'll talk mostly about the exploration. But for communication, visualization is also very important, and we'll talk about that later in this course. So you want to present your ideas, you want to explain. Visualizations can provide some evidence and support for whatever message that you have. And ideally, they also help you to influence and persuade people to your point of view. And on the other hand, on exploratory side, it helps you to analyze the data, explore it, assess the situation, determine how to proceed or just decide what to do next or what kinds of questions to ask. Now, communication typically is done without you being present, right? So it, it's usually a report that you give to somebody. So, um, and a great 
um, example or lots of grades of examples of communication visualizations come from the printed media. In particular, the New York Times has a fantastic graphics department and then do a lot of statistical analyses and a lot of great visualizations. So here is one of you know, baseball statistics and noticing that Barry Bonds in the red curve there has a bunch of kinks in the curves that may or may not have to do with steroid use. Um, and there's lots of interesting information on this. So communication can happen without you being present. Now sometimes it's a presentation where you are present and then of course it's a totally different medium. And we'll talk about that difference when we talk more about communication. On the other hand, visualizations help you to explore. And I'd like you to show you a very nice example by some students at uh, WPI, Mike Berry and Brian Card, that visualize MBTA data. So they put together this website, which again is linked from the slides. Um, so first of all, you, it's all interactive, so you see little animations of the T, and this is all data-driven, right? They scraped T data, which, by the way, is publicly available. You can scrape or actually get an API for MBTA data, and you get the position of every train and every bus in the MBTA system. And then they looked at some patterns. So one of the patterns was, well, let's look at the schedule of these trains. So here is the three lines that they looked at, the red line, the blue line, and the orange line. And here is the time of day. And if you look at one of those trains, it shows you basically when the train left Alewife and when it moved to Ashmont in this case. And it shows you kind of the progression of that train over time. Remember, time goes from top to bottom. And on the right, you have some annotations that are uh, pretty interesting. But by and large, what we can see is like early in the morning, you have a pretty regular way of train movement. Then, you know, around here, there is a rush hour, right? Morning rush hour. So there's a lot more trains all of a sudden. Uh, and then it calms down a little bit towards noontime. And then all of a sudden, uh, there is another rush hour. And then something strange happens here. All of these trains are bunched up, and some of these trains are delayed. And it turns out there was a disabled train on the red line. Um, who is taking the T, by the way? Just curious. Not that many. And who is taking the red line? OK, so you guys know that the red line frequently breaks down. Um, so there is another disabled train here on the orange line in the evenings and so on. So you can see these patterns. And then there is all of a sudden no night trains, right, except for something. I mean, there's some trains that are being moved at night. Um, and then the morning starts again. You can overlay all of these. So now you see all of the different lines on top of each other. And you see different patterns. Again, you see that the red line in general has the longest duration. Not surprising. It's the longest of the lines. But you also see the widest spread of duration, right? So you see a lot of spread. And this was just for one particular week. Then they looked at the people. How many people actually enter those trains depending on the time of day and depending on the day of the week. So here are the different weeks, here are the times of days, and then within you have the number of people depending on the time of day. And you see these patterns, you know, you see that, of course, around morning and evening rush hour, there's most people on those different lanes. But you can also see the patterns throughout the week, so that, you know, different weeks have different patterns. And then they looked at the number of people per subway station, and uh, just my luck, Harvard is actually the busiest subway station in the whole system. So it's about 20,000 uh, people per day. Um, but you can see, you know, for all these different stations, the different patterns. Then you can look at how do people's number of people and the train movements affect each other. So this is called a horizon graph. It's basically a line graph, but it's folded onto each other. You kind of have to look at the different shades of gray and kind of stack them up in your mind. So in other words, where it's sort of you know, dark gray, that's the highest peak. And you know, again, you see the, the typical patterns of morning and evening rush hour. But then you can compare that if it's slower than normal or faster than normal, indicated on the bottom with green. So on the weekends, everything is faster than normal. But during the week, you, know, you see these particular patterns on Thursdays and on Mondays, where it typically is slower. And then on the left, you can see the visualization to actually see exactly 
why the trains were slower and where the holdups were along those uh, different lines. And then you can visualize your commute, so you can indicate you know, your commute. So I'm going from, let's see, from Alewife to Harvard Square, and that's my pattern. And so you see the scatter plot of all the different ta uh, trains, basically the duration and the minutes between the trains, and you kind of see a widespread on particular times uh, during that week. So again, that's because of train delays. So it's a really nice piece of data exploration, right? And I, I kind of, when I, whenever I look at this, in my mind, I see those students working through the data and coming up with new questions as they work through the data. And we want you to get to the point where you're able to do exactly this, right? We want you to be able to explore the data and then come up with new questions. And then, of course, we also want you to be able to model the data to make predictions, recommendations, and so on. Here is another piece um, from my own work. This is an interactive visualization of genes for different, two different species of yeast in this particular case. Um, I'm not going to get into the details. The point I want to make here is that some of these exploratory visualizations are relatively complex, and they're made for specialists. And so, you know, sometimes if you have a very specialized problem, in particular in genomics or proteomics, you have to build specialized visualizations to really explore a tool. A bar graph or a scatter plot would not help. And more importantly, interaction becomes crucial. So you need to be, to interactive, need to be able to interactively explore the data in order to see those different patterns. OK, so today I want to spend the rest of the time talking about what makes a visualization effective, uh, because that's going to be a big part of what you're going to do, and so it's good for you to know some basic principles that make visualizations effective. Now, unfortunately, if you go online, a lot of the visualizations you see are not effective, right? Um, they're cluttered, they're crowded, they use weird 3D effects that are not really helpful, and they basically don't help you to decrease your cognitive load. Visualizations are supposed to help you offload your mental processes onto the visualization so that you can, visual, with your visual system, see patterns without having to think very hard. Whereas these really force you to think very hard and to read legends and to really think about the visualization, which is not the purpose of a good visualization. And there's a whole website, WTF Visualizations, that um, has some really great examples of fails. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that, and it's, it's quite fun, actually. Now, effective visualizations have five principles, and I'm going to talk about four of them today, and we'll talk about storytelling in another lecture when we talk about communication. But you have to have integrity, you have to keep it simple, you have to use the right kind of display, and you have to use color very carefully. Now, these are all common sense, but the reason I'm teaching you this is because common sense is easily forgotten as soon as you deal with data, right? And you just do your thing and you use the you know, chart wizards or whatever your tool gives you. And unfortunately, a lot of the chart wizards that you might use, in particular in programs like Excel, are not very effective. They actually give you the wrong choices and they give you, quite frankly, very ineffective visualizations. So the first point is having graphical integrity. So let me illustrate that with a couple examples. Um, one of the uh, stalwarts of integrity is, of course, Fox News. Um, so they showed this visualization, if Bush tax cuts expire, and then they show you the top tax rate now and, you know, when they expire. What's the message here? Yes? That's right. It looks like it's increasing a lot, but it's really because it doesn't start from zero. Yes? So I've seen some charts where the change like that isn't a lot, and so I sort of would want them to zoom in to make the, clear, the change more clear. So what's yeah. your view on when you should do these kinds of zoom -ins? Yes. So there's not many hard rules in visualization. There's only one. Okay? That's a hard rule. 
you shall not ever violate that rule. And that is, your bar chart has to start at zero. <laughs> so, so the reason is, what do we actually judge visually when we look at a bar chart? What is it in a bar that we're actually looking at? Height or length, you know? And so that's really what matters. And how do you measure height? Well, from the bottom to the top. And if that bottom is cut off at some arbitrary rate, then you're just not getting the visual impression of the data. You're getting some impression, right? But that impression is not the truth. The truth is this. This is the bar that starts from zero. Now, I understand the desire that you sometimes want to show those very minute changes. If that's the case, don't use a bar chart. What could you use instead of a bar chart to show something that has a very minute change? Something that doesn't require you to make a length judgment. A line plot? Yes, we'll talk about line plots. When are line plots good? To show you what? To show you trends. Trends over time, typically. Um, you could use a dot plot. Just put dots at the top of where your bars end and forget the bar. That's called a dot plot, right? Fine, because you don't need the length judgment. You're looking at position. Okay, so use a dot plot if that's what you want to do. But if you show a bar chart, hard rule, always start at zero. Fox News again, they show a line chart like this. What's wrong with this one? <laughs> Job loss by quarter. <laughs> Obama's doing a terrible job. What's wrong? Please speak up. I can't hear you guys. Yes? It's not the same quarter, right? What's up with that x-axis? It's not, you know. The units are wrong, right. And again, we don't you know, start at zero. Now, not starting at zero from, for a line plot is actually acceptable. But let me first show you, this is what it really looks like. So if you look at the rate of change, right, the rate of change of job losses is actually slowing down. The slope is getting smaller. So, you know, Obama is actually, whatever he did at that point was actually starting to work. So, but that wasn't the message they were trying to convey. Now, this has to do with integrity. Once somebody figures out that you're lying with your graph, you lose your integrity. And if there's one thing that's really hard to get back in life in general, it is your integrity and your reputation. So don't lose it, right? It's just a bad thing. Don't do that. Here is the comparison of a line graph that starts at zero and one that doesn't. Now, this is a little hard to read. It's exactly the same data shown with two different lines. The orange line on the top is using the left scale, which is zero-based. And the blue line showing the same data is using the non-zero-based scale on the right. And these are just shown in the same plot to show you the difference. Now this comes back to the point you were making before, which is if you have minute differences in your graph, you may want to emphasize those by not having a zero-based you know, axis. And that's fine, but if you do that, what must you do too? Yes? I think you have to draw people's attention to the fact that the lines. Correct draw people's attention to it because most people assume that whatever they're looking at is zero-based. That's what we were told in high school. So if it's not zero-based, you have to tell them. You can do this with text or if you give a presentation, you can do it by pointing it out. But you have to do it. There is another uh, mistake here in this graph. This is, of course, from Yale. Uh, <laughs> so what did they get wrong? It doesn't add to 100%. So if you show a graph where the math is wrong, um, you know, your integrity will suffer. So don't do that either. OK, so integrity is important. Basically, the message is, is you know, quite easy to understand. Don't lie with your graphs, either willingly or unwillingly. Now, getting the math wrong, OK, understand. That might be a mistake. But you know, it might make sense that you double check it before you put it on the front page. 
So just make sure you get it right, because if somebody notices a mistake or notices that you're lying with your graphs, it's, it's bad. Keep your visualization simple. And you know, this is the Tufty piece of the lecture. Edward Tufty is a famous person in visualization. Who has heard of Edward Tufty? Yeah, fair number. And he wrote fabulous books about visualizations and effective visualizations. And his main mantra is, keep it simple. So he coined this term data ink ratio. It's a little abstract. It's more playful than anything. But he says, basically, maximize your data ink, which is the ink or the pixels used to actually show the data, and minimize the total ink used in your graphic. Right? So minimize anything else that doesn't contribute to the data. So in this case, you know, the shadow and the 3D bar graphs and so on do not contribute anything to your data. They're just there for decoration. Get rid of them. And you know, this particular 2D bar graph is more effective. Now, you could argue it's not as pretty, but pretty wasn't the objective. The objective was to communicate the data. If communicating the data is your objective, and as a data scientist it should be, then you have to use these very simple graphs. 3D is generally bad. This is a meta pie chart of why 3D pie charts are bad. Um, wrap your head around that one. Um, but basically, don't use 3D. 3D is generally bad for two reasons. Number one, it wastes these pixels, these non-data pixels. And secondly, with the perspective that you're you know, putting into the 3D you're basically distorting the data, right? So it's, it's, it's just bad. Avoid chart junk. That's another Tufty term. Chart junk is anything that you can remove from your chart that will not change the data display. So in this particular graph, what can we remove? Background, lines, color. Yes, what else? Yes, the, the frame. And now I would be happy, but you know, in this particular case, um, this designer, Tim Bray, goes one step further. You can actually play a little trick. You can get rid of the other lines, too, and introduce these nice white lines here, which are just gaps in your bars. Or actually, you put a white line on top of the bar. And it sort of gives the impression of a continuous line. Our visual system likes to finish lines. And so we see these lines, even though they're not really there. So don't do stuff like this, <laughs> right? Um, you know, you're laughing, but, but you know, these are online. So this is actually from the Matplotlib gallery, right? So the, these tools even encourage you to use these things. And that's, and that's really not fun. I like the one with the banana texture in the background. <laughs> OK, so the next simple rule is using the right display. And here is a handy dandy chart uh, for telling you if you want to show comparisons, here might be a couple of graphs you could show. If you want to show distributions, here is a bunch of others, and so on. So let me quickly walk you through this in the next few slides. But you know, if you want to go back and study this once the slides are online, uh, you're encouraged, and it's also online. So what is a good chart to use for comparisons? Comparisons of data, comparisons between, let's say, different categories. Bar chart. Bar chart. I like this one. <laughs> Reminds me I'm thirsty. <laughs> um, so bar charts, as I said, the only hard rule about bar charts is really that they have to start at zero. Now, something else that I see people do, which you know, is not very effective, <clears throat> is instead of a bar chart, they're using lines. So you, know, you have different categories. On the left is the bar chart version. On the right is the line chart version. Um, why is the line chart version bad? Yes? It seems to imply that you followed, like, say, the same 10 year olds until they were 12 and now you're done. Yes. Like two separate groups. Exactly. So it seems to imply that the data is not separate, right? It seems to imply the data is continuous. So lines imply continuous data, and bars imply separate or discrete data. And in particular, if you have discrete categories, then you want to use bars. There's a nice blog about 
bar charts by Nathan Yao, who runs another great uh, data science blog called Flowing Data. Uh, Nathan is a statistician and he has many different analyses and he in particular points out every time somebody does a bad visualization in statistics, which happens apparently every day. <laughs> so there's a lot of really interesting blogs, uh, posts about bad visualizations. And he has this nice blog about bar chart baseline start at zero and it actually walks you through a bunch of examples. So again, maybe in the comfort of your dorm or living room, you can look at that at home and, and you know, check it out. Okay, so much for bar charts. How about trends? Lines, right? Trends are lines and we've all seen the stock market visualizations. Now something interesting here, all of a sudden we see bars. But it's time and time is continuous. Shouldn't be showing lines. So why, you know, first of all, what is this? Well, this is volume, right? Volume of stock trading. Why did they use bars here? Yeah. That's right. You can think of it as discrete data, right? So we're really interested in the volume for each day. We're not interested in the trend. So it's really a comparison of different volumes for each day. So trends versus comparisons. Proportions, how do we show proportions? What is the most classic and probably most widely used visualization ever? Pie charts. Pie charts. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, pie charts have a bad reputation and we'll talk about why in a minute, but one of the visualization people has a nice blog called Eager Pies. He actually runs a blog called Eager Eyes so he went from eager eyes and made eager pies and he points out bad pie charts and um, it's a funny blog. The other way to show proportions is with a stacked bar graph, right? So now instead of showing the proportion in a pie, we're looking at the stacked bar. Or we could even, if we wanted to show trends and proportions, use a stacked area graph, which is basically a line chart filling in the pieces in between. Now, how do you read this? Um, so, for example, for West, for the orange bit here, it's actually not starting at the zero line, right? It's starting on top of south, on top of the blue line. So that's what makes these hard to read because we basically have to imagine reducing the blue line to a flat line and then figuring out what might be the shape of that orange line. So in terms of showing you trends, this is pretty horrible. In, sh in terms of showing you proportions, it's slightly better because you can judge the proportions with the area. But we'll talk about area judgments in a minute and turns out area judgments aren't as good as length judgments. So if you really wanted to show proportions or maybe trends, you might be better off with a bar chart or with a line graph. Don't do this. Um, you know, pie charts within pie charts, that's pretty, pretty bad. Now, I'm not of the opinion that you should avoid pie charts at all costs, as some other visualization experts will tell you. Um, I actually think if a pie chart is designed well and doesn't have too many categories, it can function perfectly fine. But you should know that a pie chart is not as effective as a bar graph. Correlations, how do we show correlations between different data? Scatter plot. I like this one. It shows you the difficulty of eating fruit versus their tastiness. Um, this is an XKCD, one of our favorite comic blocks. And I think it was titled Effing Grapefruit. <laughs> um. <laughs> so um, scatter plots have been considered in the past as almost being too complicated for the public. And a few years ago, somebody at the New York Times told me that they don't like to show scatter plots in their paper. They seem to have changed their opinion. So I think what's happening is that the visual literacy of people in general is increasing. And so scatter plots are actually now okay to use. Um, although you, it might make sense to explain them just to be sure that everybody knows exactly what you're showing. Don't do 3D scatter plots. <laughs> All right, distributions comes up quite a lot in data science. How do you show a distribution? I'm not going to ask Joe. I think he knows the answer. <laughs> Stat 110 people, come on. 
Okay, histogram, thank you. Histograms, what do you have to choose in a histogram? The bin size. If you do that, you have to play with the bin size because you don't know what is a good bin size. You know, there's no hard and fast rule about this. And I'd suggest to just play with it because if you change the bin size, you might get very different visuals of the same data. And all of a sudden, you might see patterns in the data that you didn't see with a larger bin size, or vice versa, right? So it's always good to play with the bin size, create a few different ones, and then pick the one that is most indicative or shows you the patterns. The continuous version of a histogram is called a density plot. So it's basically smoothing out the data, and there's different you know, ways to do that. Uh, kernel density estimation is probably the most uh, popular one. If you do have a density plot, you're basically smoothing out the data. So here is you know, eruptions of a volcano, um, and you see it's a bimodal distribution. So it's nice to show the data like they did here on the bottom with these kind of scattered points. And a lot of the visualization packages allow that to happen. So you can actually show the raw data in addition to the smoothed out density that you computed. And then there's a 2D version of density plots. And again, um, these are typically called heat maps. So these are also very popular and useful. So all of this can be done in Seaborn. And there's some nice tutorials on the Seaborn website that I encourage you to look at. They actually walk you through all of the different visualization types with little examples. And they tell you what are they good for. And you know, basically what I told you and some more. So um, we have time. I'd like to do a quick design exercise. I'm going to show you some data. And I'd like you to take out a piece of paper. It's very important that it's paper and a pen. Don't do this electronically, please. Uh, take out paper and a pen. So here is the data. The data is a very, very simple table. OK, so here is the scenario. There is a, an experiment in a school. And they took a class of kids. And they basically asked them before the experiment, how do you feel about science? And there were five categories of answers. You know, it was a Likert test. So you had to choose one of those five. You know, they were either excited, kind of interested, OK, not so great, or bored by science. Okay, And then they did some fun science stuff in class. And then they did a post survey. So after that fun science experiment, they did a post survey and asked exactly the same questions and then tabulated the results. So this is classic survey data. Do not worry about the numbers, please. Do not worry about the exact numbers. Doesn't matter. For this exercise, I'd like you to just think about by yourselves for two minutes of as many visualizations as possible to show this survey data. Okay, Think of as many as possible. Accuracy doesn't matter. Just sketch. That's why I want you to use pen pencil and paper. Quantity is the measure of success. Quantity. As many as possible. Think of as many visualizations as possible to visualize this data. Just brainstorm by yourself and just sketch as many as you can for two minutes. And if you're watching this at home, I really encourage you to do the same thing. Take out pencil, paper, two minutes. OK, go. Sure. No, this is measuring the number of kids that answered each of these categories. So 19 kids before said they were excited. Okay. 25 kids said they were kind of interested. Okay, so are, oh, gotcha. How many kids total? I don't know, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> for this exercise, it doesn't matter. Can we assume it's the same for both? Yes. Okay. Assume it's the same for both. Don't worry about the exact data. Really, just do qualitative sketching. Do you have to display all the categories in comparison? Sorry? Do you have to display all of the categories in comparison? Yes, it should show all of the data, all of the categories. Okay. 
Could I give you one more minute? Okay, pencils down, hands up. <laughs> um, how many of you had uh, two or fewer than two you know, visualizations right now? Two or fewer, okay, three or fewer, four or fewer, five, six, seven. All right, the sixes have it. <laughs> As I said, quantity was the measure. Now, why did I insist on quantity? Sorry? To get, to get you thinking, right. Yes? Yes, keep them simple, exactly. Don't worry about the details. Don't worry about, you know, tick marks on the axes. Doesn't matter for this exercise. Yes? Yes, exactly. Come up with as many possible solutions. So see which ones work and which ones don't work. Come up with as many possible solutions so you can span the space of all designs. Now, that space is pretty big, right? So you want to try to cover it. And it's been shown in human-computer interaction many times that design really is an exercise of creating many different alternatives. And so that's the idea. Create many alternatives, do it quickly. Why do we do it quickly? Why don't we use electronic tools and make them nice? Yes, figure out what works before you get attached. Before you get attached. You have to be able to kill your babies. And it's much easier to do that if the baby is ugly. No, no, that's not right. <laughs> that's not right. No, that's not right. Never kill babies. Never kill babies. But. Uh, <laughs> Don't spend a lot of time on something because if you do, you get emotionally invested, right? If I, if I used Excel and you know, put the table in Excel and then I started to play with the chart wizard and I start to futz around with the axes that are always wrong, <laughs> then I'm invested. I invested so much time. I can't give up. You know, I'm, I'm kind of stuck. So design is all about creating lots of different alternatives very quickly without getting attached. Yes? That's right. So the more familiar, familiarity you have, the longer you work with the data, the more you might actually start misrepresenting things because you might get stuck in a certain mindset. And you, know, you might sort of imagine certain trends or certain features in the data that are actually not there. And so it's much better to explore the space. So um, why don't you quickly turn to your neighbor and, and sort of exchange for like just one minute, exchange sort of what you have done so far. Okay, so 
<coughs> Again, we could probably go on for a while in this discussion, and unfortunately, I don't have time for you to show me what you've done, but let me just show you what I did, and I didn't do what I told you to do. <laughs> I used electronic tools. So I did put this data into a tool called Tableau, and I created a bunch of visualizations. And I should point out, this was uh, basically an idea that Cole Nussbaumer had, who's a data visualization consultant. But here are the couple of things I came up with. So the first thing that I came up with was the pie chart, right? We're talking about proportions. So here you see the before on the left and the after on the right. And, you know, the pie chart shows you these proportions. Now, it's not the best tool to show you the change, right? So you, to, to see the change, you kind of have to compare the different pie wedges going back and forth. I tried to make that a little bit easier by choosing the appropriate colors. So for everything that's exciting and kind of interested, which is a positive feeling, I use this blue color. And for everything else, I kind of use the gray scale. So you kind of see that the positive sentiments have increased between the before and the after. Then the next idea was, well, pie charts are not that great. Let's do a stacked bar graph, right? Another way to show proportions. So here again, same color scheme, same data. It's just now using a stacked bar graph both of which add up to 100%. Then here is a grouped bar graph, which groups the different bars for each of the categories. Again, left is before, right is after. So you see there is you know, an increase in kind of interested and in excited categories. There is an, a decrease in the OK category. And now you might wonder, well, where did those kids go, right? Did they go? all to the more excited category? Well, it turns out some of the kids ended up more bored after that experiment, right? There's two kids over there. Where do these kids come from? So that's an interesting question. Once you look at this, you might actually try to answer that particular question. I couldn't do that because that was totally made up. <laughs> but this is something you might want to do. Then here is a difference bar graph. How many of you came up with a difference bar graph? Oh, great. So those are really useful. It shows you the difference between the before and the after, right? It's a very simple idea. And it makes it visually very, very easy to understand. And again, we see the OKs decreased and all the other ones increased, including the not great and the board. So again, that raises some questions. And finally, I did something that you probably didn't think of. Who thought of a slope graph? Wow. <laughs> did you take CS171? <laughs> No? Wow, this is impressive. Slope graphs are not that widely known, but they're really, really useful. Um, so on the left is the before, on the right is the after, and the line or the slope shows you what changed it or, or the, the rate of change. And then you can reinforce that with the line width and with the color. So color is negative change, and or uh, sorry, blue is negative change, orange is positive change. And then the width of the bar shows you how much of a change it is. And again, you know, you see that the OKs went down, but you also see that the bores went up. So it kind of gives you the same message. So that's all the stuff that I did. Yes? That's right. Very good point. So his point was you lose some information, in particular, you know, the nominal information of where these kids came from before and so on. That's absolutely right. So that's why I suggest to do more than one visualization. Visualization is very good in answering typically one question, right? So if you have more than one question, you have to have different visualizations as a rule of thumb. So you really want to play with different visualizations in your data and in your IPython notebooks, I might add, to see the patterns. Now, the last thing, which is not a visualization, might actually be the thing that ends up in the report, which is this. After the program, 68% of kids expressed interest compared to 44% going into it. So sometimes if you have a message and if you want to make that message stand out, a single number might be the right answer, in particular when you communicate the result to somebody else. You know, you don't want to show this to your boss because he's going to spend 10 minutes asking you questions about the graph and what it means. But if you show this, they get it, right? So sometimes you want to communicate something very succinctly and sometimes a number is the right answer. But for exploration, by all means, Use visualization quickly to make sense of the data. 
So visualizations have a large design space. There is many different kinds of visualizations. And the question might be, which ones are more effective than which other ones? And there's actually an answer to that question. It comes out of perceptual research that's been going on for decades, at least 30 years, in psychology, in cognitive psychology, and in perception. And we actually know a lot about this. Here's just a bunch of the studies, starting with uh, Stevens' famous power law study. He found out in psychophysics, basically, how different sensations are being perceived. And it turns out, you know, we're basically very good at judging length, so that that uh, plot shows you the intensity of the sensation versus the sensation that you report. So length is kind of a linear scale. Uh, we're underestimating volume and loudness, and we're totally overestimating electric shock and heaviness. Now, these experiments were done before IRB <laughs> got into place, so maybe ethically a little questionable. <laughs> But nevertheless, it's interesting data. And, and then there were a lot of experiments in visualization about which visualization types are easier to read. So all I'm saying is what I'm going to tell you next, which will be summarized in one graph, is the result of 30 years of research. Okay? So you get a lot of bang for the buck in this lecture. <laughs> okay, so to bring home the point, I want to actually run a quick, very informal, non-scientific experiments with you. And I'm going to just ask you a bunch of questions. So the first one is, how much longer is bar B compared to bar A? Just think about that for a second. And then raise your hand with the number that you're thinking it is. It's an integer, I can tell you. So it's a whole number. So OK, I see a lot of fours. I see a lot of fours, some fives. Lots of fours. Yes, OK, very good. We're good at judging length. How much steeper <laughs> is slope A compared to slope B? Again, hold up your hand with a, with a number. I see twos, I see threes, I see fives, I see fours, not so many fours. I see lots of twos, I see a six. Okay, if you do the math, it's four times steeper. Okay, we're not so good at judging slope. How much larger <laughs> is circle B in area, in area compared to circle A? Hold up your hand. I see fours, fives, sevens, six, threes, eight, five. OK. The answer is 10. <laughs> I told you we're underestimating area, and you still got it wrong. <laughs> Why? Why? Why do we underestimate area? What are we actually judging? So, the radius or the diameter, right? So it's very hard, you know. OK, so now how much darker <laughs> is B compared to A? You're laughing because you know this is harder, right? We're getting to things that are harder to do. I'm just going to tell you it's twice as dark. Who cares? You know, you wouldn't know that, right? So the problem is people use intensity to show quantitative numbers. And that doesn't make any sense. Don't use intensity to show quantitative numbers. We have no way of judging them. We can't tell that this is even twice as dark than that. So don't, don't do that. What we can do is we can use intensity for showing ordinal numbers, like this one is darker than that one. So making this relative judgment is easy, but the absolute judgment is basically impossible. And then finally, color. You know, to use color as an encoding, you must have a color map or a color scale, right? So how much bigger is the value in B compared to the value in A? No hands go up because you guys are thinking right now. You have to judge you know, which color matches here, what is that number, then you have to do the same thing for the green, and then you have to compare those two numbers, right? And the answer is four, but it's a much harder cognitive task. So color is also not good for quantitative encoding. And that's a shame, because when are we using color to quantitatively encode values? 
maps because the space is already taken, right? The map takes the position away. It's already there. So we only have other variables to show values. Yes? That's right. Very good point. If you're only showing qualitative differences, then color is perfectly fine. That's why maps actually work. Because qualitatively, we can tell the difference. On a weather map, if there's a red thingy moving towards me, I know I better run inside, right? <laughs> um, so that works. But it's not that I know exactly the value of what that red means. So here is that chart that I promised. Summary of 30 years of research. And you just figured this out yourself. <laughs> so it's really common sense, but people forget it all the time. Position and length are the most efficient, slope and angle less, area even less, and then intensity and color and shape, I might add, are really bad for quantitative data. Now, we can actually subdivide this. So for quantitative data, you really should only be using position, length, and slope. But if you have ordered data, you can also use area and intensity. Ordered meaning this is bigger than that. That's why bubble maps work, right? Those maps where you have circles on the map, that works fine because you can tell this thing here in the east is bigger than that thing here in the west just by looking at the size of the circle. That sort of relative judgment works. The absolute judgment, like how much bigger is that circle, doesn't work so much. And then finally, color and shape, you ideally only use for categories. So line graphs and bar graphs are most effective, which probably explains why they're so ubiquitous. You will use them a lot, and there is nothing wrong with it. I know they're boring, but they're most effective, and they work. So if your goal is communication of data, that's probably your best bet. Less effective are pie charts, right, which is one of the reasons people hate them. You know, you have to actually judge the angle, so that's already hard, and the area of that pie wedge, and or. So it's a dual encoding, that's kind of good. Unfortunately, more recently, the poor cousin of the pie chart, which is the donut chart on the lower left, has become super popular. And what happens in a donut chart, you're taking away the angle judgment, right? So you're relying completely on an area judgment, which is very, very hard to do. You, you know, I could make that experiment very easy. You could not judge how much bigger the gray is compared to the black. Um, I want to again point out that I'm not totally against pie charts. Sometimes they have their place. So if they're well designed like this one here, you know, you can actually see company B and C on the left in the pie chart very easily, sort of as a, if you will, qualitative judgment. Whereas in the bar graph, it's much more analytical. I have, the, I have a much easier time seeing the actual numbers but it may be a little bit harder to get that qualitative judgment that B and C together are bigger than all of these other companies combined. And least effective, as I said, is color, and unfortunately we use this a lot when we look at maps. Now, the very least you can do when you use color on a map is use the right color scale, and do not use the rainbow scale, and I'm gonna explain very briefly why not. So color is difficult. And the best you can do with color is not to use it, right? Um, so I recommend, whenever possible, don't use color. Now, sometimes you have to use it, but use it very carefully. So if you go to your favorite tools like Excel, they give you a bazillion color choices. And this is a published graph, I think, in a, a famous journal like Nature or Science. Um, where they actually plotted all of these different colors and they expect people to be able to judge the differences. I think this thing has like 30 different colors. There is no way that you can judge the differences in this, even if you have really good color vision. So how many colors do you think can people normally distinguish without too much cognitive effort? Five, exactly. So it's basically five plus minus two so it's like seven, you know, sometimes it's less depending on the circumstance. You might be able to push it to eight or nine, but don't go to 10. Don't even think about going above 10. So whenever you're in a situation where you think you have to use more than 10 colors, don't
don't do it and think about an alternative visualization that uses much fewer colors. And there's always an alternative. For example, you can use small multiples. You, instead of having all the graphs in one big visualization, you break it down into you know, lots of replicas of smaller visualizations with different graphs with the same scales to make that easy to read. So here is colors for categories that are recommended. They're your crayon colors, right? So if you have categories, start with your crayon colors. Those are probably good choices. If you have ordered data, you can actually use the luminance channel, maybe combined with some color, to show the ordering. It's easy for us to say that dark is you know, less or more than white. And it's even easy for us to judge how much less or more. Um, but you know, it's only good for making these relative judgments. And if you have a map, or if you have, in this case, a 3D visualization that need a color scale, uh, be very careful. Do not use the rainbow. So here is why. If you use the rainbow color map, which is unfortunately the default in almost all of the scientific tools, you end up with stuff like this. And what ends up happening is that the green, sorry, the yellow and the red predominates your vision. You know, visually, we're much more likely to see red and yellow than we're likely to see blue and green. And so that visual dominance is called a nonlinearity. So we see this in a nonlinear way that does not correspond to the underlying data. So your visual system distorts basically what you're seeing. And so that's bad. And so, you know, it's perceptually nonlinear. If you just compare that grayscale on the top and the rainbow scale on the bottom, you can see very easily that the yellow and the red just dominates, even though in terms of the data it shouldn't, right? The data is shown in the grayscale on top. So very often you can just use a grayscale color map, which is actually the most adequate in most cases. And then you can use color to highlight. Color is great for highlighting. So show your data in grayscale and then highlight the values that are really important, like maybe above a certain threshold or whatever. So don't do the rainbow. Um, I know even in Matplotlib, you know, there's a lot of uh, sort of defaults baked in that make you use the rainbow. But if I see people using the rainbow, you'll fail this class. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, but really don't. Um, and there is actually nice color scales uh, in Seaborn. Another reason not to use the rainbow is for people that are colorblind, which is about 10% of the male population. Okay, 10%. Now, colorblindness is actually not a binary thing. It's, it's really a gradation. And in general, men see colors differently and less well than women. And that has some, uh, you know, some reasons in evolution. Um, so whenever my wife tells me the color of the things I'm wearing, I believe her. <laughs> <laughs> and you should too. <laughs> so here is a simulation. On the left is the color shown for normal vision. And then here is a bunch of simulations what colorblind people would see. Um, most of the color blindness is in the red-green channel. So you can see that the red-greens are basically indistinguishable. They kind of look beige or, or yellowish for colorblind people. So again, another reason to avoid the rainbow color map. Now, color is difficult, and it's best to leave it to professionals. And fortunately, we have a nice tool that everybody can use, which is called the Color Brewer, where Cynthia Brewer, who's a geography, um, professor in geography, basically designed nice color scales that are perceptually uniform and that are very useful and have been shown to be effective. So she does this for nominal or categorical data, like apples, oranges, bananas, or for ordinal data, meaning ordered data from zero to a maximum or with a zero in the middle between a minimum and a maximum. And the tool shows you a map, but it's really useful also for visualizations that are not a map. So anytime you need a, a, basically a color scale, go to this tool. And you can give it, you know, how many classes do you have? So, you know, for example, we have four different classes. Then you can pick your favorite basic color, and it shows you, in this case, a sequential one. This is a diverging one with a zero in the middle. It allows you to make it colorblind safe. So here are all the color scales that are colorblind safe. So instead of red-green, you might want to choose a red-blue color scale. Um, 
And it also tells you if it's print friendly or photocopy safe. Um, so there's only one in this case that is photocopy safe if you have a grayscale photocopier. So it's a very useful tool. And thankfully, Seaborn has actually the Color Brewer scales built in. And so if you search for Color Brewer Seaborn, uh, you'll find the particular command that allows you to use that color scale. So that's all I have for today. Just to recap, have integrity, keep it simple, think about the right display, think about the, the chart I showed you with the effectiveness scales, right? That's the only thing you should really remember. Position and length are more effective than area and angle. That's sort of the main thing and use color very, very carefully and do not use the rainbow color map. We'll talk about storytelling and visualization later. And uh, just, you know, further reading, Tufti's books are fantastic. And also Stephen Few, who is more on the business intelligence side, has a bunch of books that are really interesting if you have business data, but actually are generally interesting for visualization. That's all I have. See you all on, what is today? On Tuesday. Thank you.